to the part you've all been waiting for. Um, we've got Andrew Horn here, but I just want to say a quick um, introduction for fingers. Uh, so, yes, clap, you can clap. Okay, March 15th, 1982, a kid named Fingers stepped through the doors of the WBAB studios on Long Island and into a life of rock and roll, motorcycles, and public service, if you didn't know, um, and set his course of his life over the next 33 years. If there is a voice that personifies WBAB, it's Fingers. From his extensive music knowledge, personal anecdotes about legendary artists, and relatable Long Island family adventures, he tells it all and then some every weekday afternoon on 102.3 WBAB. He also rocks Long Island to the core of every Sunday night from 9 to 11 as the host of the longest running hard rock and heavy metal show, Fingers Metal Shop. And while not sitting at the mic, um, he uses his Harley to free himself from the stresses of daily life. I didn't write this. <laughs> um, but one thing I, wanna, I just want to make everyone aware, I know you all listen to him on the radio, but if you don't know about all the really good deeds he does, um, he runs two major charity motorcycle runs a year um, and attends countless others. He raises funds for local organizations like Moore Camp Adventure and Mather House and Long Island Cares and the West Islip Breast Cancer Coalition. And he's clearly supporting our nonprofit organization, the Gold Coast Film Festival. So we are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have him here. Um, and he, you think of no better expert to be here on the panel today. Wow. Whoever wrote that deserves <laughs> Thank you very much. Andrew Horn, man, you made a fucking awesome movie. Come on, let's hear for our director. I think we're going to have to change your name to Andrew fucking Horn. You know, I just want to say before I go further into the, the Q&A, sitting right here are the two gentlemen. This is Roy. Stand up. Roy Gardner and my man Rick right here, Rick Muser. They were in a band called Whitefire back in the day that I did lights for, and these are the jackasses that named me Fingers. <laughs> I love you. So let's get the boys out here. Mark, JJ, you gonna come on down? Joe yeah, let's get Joe Gerber down here too. <laughs> Growing up, how many of you lived that movie? I feel specifically uh, Especially blessed in the sense that I was one of those guys right up against the stage screaming at speaks sure. and a total fan and Who knew that here we'd be all these years later? I get to play on the radio and now I get to host your film. I'm pretty 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 excited about this It is very cool So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through the audience and if you have a question that you'd like to ask any of the gentlemen up on this day is here Raise your hand. I'll bring you the mic and you can ask Who's going first? Come on, you chicken shit. I knew Gail would step up. Ladies and gentlemen, Gail Flug, local rivet head from Fingers Metal Shop. You gonna stand up? You are standing up. <laughs> that didn't really change much, did it? Um, where did you get the old footage from um, Speaks and Hammerheads? From JJ's basement. Uh, over the years, um, Stuff would just like pile up. Uh, we would grab things. Joe had a ton of stuff in his archives, and you know, fans over the years did it, but we didn't know at the time that you know what I kind of miss, I, Mark. It's amazing that we don't have a, a Speaks Night right on tape. Yeah, it blows speaks me away. Speaks Legendary Nights, Found Casino Legendary Nights. Yeah, we nights, just, yeah. you know, we got what we got. I guess Joe, sometimes we have a system where we grab the Yeah, tapes, right? the, the, occasionally it comes and have a system where I bring somebody down. Typically, we were very protective of the image, so we discouraged tape from happening. A lot of times, you know, there are, there are snippets that I would confiscate and make them stop uh, videotaping, which in retrospect, I would change. It's uh, amazing we have what we have because as time went on and, the, and, and Andrew was really getting into this, and he said, what do you have? And then all of a sudden, stuff would show up, and I'd look at it, and I'd be blown away. I'd say, wow, man, that was amazing. Like stuff from Gemini and, you know, crazy stuff. So it just kind of accumulated, but it was never um, archived with an intent. No. Getting. It was mostly just kept away from everybody because we wanted control over it as much as possible. You gotta remember back then, no cell phones, 
know any portable recording devices. You know, uh, a VCR camera was 45 pounds and it was the size of a moving box. <laughs> but uh, these guys are being very polite about it. Uh, the question was, where'd you get the stuff? Most of it we took. <laughs> we really did. Because we didn't want it to go anywhere. We didn't want anybody to, to do anything. So it was Joe Gerber's to go, job to go get it. Well, and if we found out, the rest of us filming. would back him up and say, I yeah, think we're you taking should give that. that to me. Yeah. yeah, that's how it went. Hi there. Uh, my name is Andy Blinn. And I'm such a huge fan of Twisted Sister. So um, I got to say, that movie really was so awesome. So anyways, I'm kind of young to notice that, um, even though I kind of grew up listening to Twisted Sister music, and um, such a huge fan of Dee Snyder. I used to have really long hair like Dee's way back in My the day. My condolences to you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, JJ, um, I had a question um, about that place in Aberdeen, New Jersey. Um, uh, how long was it uh, there? For in what year? That was the Fountain Casino, right? Yeah. It's still there. It's a catering hall, and a lot yeah. of these rooms kind of serve different purposes. It was a catering that, hall then. That room was a catering hall, and I think those guys decided at a certain point maybe we can make money doing rock because the clubs, the sizes, one two, the sizes of the clubs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I believe the Soap Factory was the biggest until the Fountain Casino opened up, and that catering hall kind of had um, movable. Movable walls, yeah, you, yeah. The, you could do 600, and then you'd blow up a wall, and that would take it to 1,000. You blow up another wall, and you'd be at 1,600. You just kept going until you could get to 5,000. Yeah, and the last wall would be 5,000. So when we kind of went in there that summer, um, the gauntlet was thrown to uh, us, a Crystal Ship, White Tiger, White, White Tiger, Tiger, and Southern Southern Cross. Those are four. Yeah. Those are the big bands, and who could draw the most? That was the big. Like I say in the movie, this predatory be number one. Um, who was going to be the biggest draw? And I think White Tiger came in at four, and Crystal Ship came in at 45, and Southern Cross came in at 4,600. And we were hell-bent on breaking that record, and I think we did 48.50. I mean, we won. That was the thing. We won. We didn't fight fair. We it wanted... Was, if you remember, it was uh, just a tad under 6,000. Oh, six, one I Saturday five, night, but the turnover was just under 6,000. But the funny thing, you want to yeah. hear like a funny club story, though, the, the, the way these guys used to count their money. You know, these clubs were owned by guys with vowels, and so, you know, the money was like, hey, disappeared, you know, I don't know. And that club particularly... That club especially was... That club especially... wasn't really there to sell drinks. They do interesting accounting, and they let Joe and me in to do accounting with them, with, the, biggest with, with the family, like they would count the registers. And the way they would do it is they had 12 registers. They would bring in 12 bags. They had 12 relatives, Vinnie, Tony, Sal, Freddie the Shoe, Billy the Horse, Frankie the Chair, Meatballs, Marinara... Little Vito, Big Vito. And, and Spicy Potato Salad, yeah, as Mark Spicy Potato out. Salad. A whole crew... And, uh, and, and they would allow the two Jews in, yeah. and Joe and I would be there, and they would come in, they would dump the cash, right? They'd open right, these and bags, and they would forever, dump the cash. Count nickels, and uh, we, one night we said to him, you hurry up, we're trying to get out of here. And it's okay, help us. They give me the 20s, they give me the 20s, they give him the 10s, they're counting the change. So they, so they, they, just, like, they, they basically divide up these piles of, th I mean, th tens of thousands of dollars, and it's me and Joe, and they're all talking Sicilian. And halfway through the counting, they stop. Like, they stop. It says, was it all? Was it all? But it sounded like a godfather. Like a, and, they, and two of them left the room. I looked at Joe. I said, you didn't pocket any of this money, did you? Like, are we going to die? I thought we were going to die. I thought, like, you didn't put a 20 in your pants or something. And what happened was, it was so, <laughs> the math was so interestingly done. They never bothered to count the bag, so only 11 came in, and they had 11 registered tapes, and they realized after finishing counting they were missing a bag. So someone stole it, and one of, them guys, one of the guys went out and comes back and goes, hey, we left it on the bar. <laughs> and that's how the nights went, some of those. That, that's, would you ask us what we remember? That's what we remember. <laughs> that, and, and getting paid by Garvey was fun, too, the, sending yeah. the, the reinforcements. Uh, my name is Jerry Donnelly. Um, Andrew, we spoke on the phone. Thank you so much for acknowledging me. Appreciate I remember that. you, yeah. Um, great job on the film, by the way. Thank you. I have 
Two questions. First is, whatever happened to Big Sal? Mm. And the second is, Joe, what did you do with the Uggs you used to wear in the clubs all the time? Ah. <laughs> ah. He scored you, too, huh? <laughs> Joe, by the way, I'm, I'm wearing an artifact of the day. These are, uh, th there were the corkies. And they smell like it. Which were, which were the winter, you know, the Roman sandals with the three-inch platforms. There were the, the legendary green boots, which I tried to wear tonight, but I couldn't get into. And these were what were known, these had, had a name. These, was, these were the socks with heels, okay? Um, because they conform to my foot rather than look like a shoe. Uh, Mendoza, what happened to Sal? Um, towards the end of our uh, club career, he got very sick and um, went to Mexico for treatment and stayed there a few years. And um, on some sort of medication, uh, he had stomach cancer. He came back, uh, allegedly cured, and actually was cancer-free for another like 14 years or so. And, uh, I don't remember how long ago now, but it was sad. He did pass away from it again and came back. But, but he was uh, part of the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah Sal, absolutely. Yeah, Anybody okay. remembers Sal Valvo, what a great guy. Because, again, uh, what, what Andrew did, and, and, and how long could a movie be? It couldn't be a 10-year movie. The, 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 and there's a lot of extras in the, in the DVD, but there's so many. The, what, you, what you guys remember, a packed room, a fun room, a crazy night, the peripherals of those nights are what made our nights interesting because otherwise they kind of blended in and you didn't remember them. So yeah. I remember just, we, I won't get into Sal's stories, but there's Sal's stories and there's oh, this man. stories and oh, there's those yeah. stories. The stories, the the stories are endless. Some of, some of you here were involved in some of them. <laughs> Pretty scary. But just think of um, the, the things that you didn't see, whether it's our memories or just some pictures that we have or the stuff that uh, Andrew came up with and he just couldn't include it with the, in the film because the film ran, I think it was about two hours, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, two hours of their team. So there's a lot of memories there um, that you guys remember in the clubs, but just think about what we went through mm -hmm. behind the scenes. You know, when we left the club or going to a club or staying in some hotel in, in Riverhead uh, <laughs> with a green swimming pool oh, yeah. and watching one of our crew members dive into it. <laughs> Let me you ask know, you a oh, question yeah. to the crowd. How many of you were surprised when you heard that D hey, that, that you saw the frustration about how long they couldn't stand it and it was like that much of a drag for us to do it? I'm just curious. Were any of you surprised? Raise your hand. No? So that actually you figured. Yeah, that, that that's interesting because good. I'll tell you what, I never, when I used to see my favorite bands when I was 17, 18, 19 years old, I thought they always had a great time. I never thought about the psychology, ever thought about the psychology well, behind D it. Well, was not real shy about sharing. Well, this is true. Yeah. But it was a grind, Mark. I mean, it, it oh, was. It was absolutely a grind. It was a grind. Without a doubt. I remember uh, uh, a quick story. I mean, just think of the cars we went through, oh. just driving hundreds of thousands of miles. I got a, a car from my father. Um, oh man! Unfortunately, my father passed away a few days before I played on stage with the band, and I got his car, an Oldsmobile. It had sixty-two thousand miles on it. Being a mechanic, and not kidding you, building everything from the ground up. Okay, when that car, when I finally decided not to use it anymore, it had four hundred eighteen thousand miles on it. Okay, and it was rotted away. And the only reason I didn't put a new motor in it was because it was rotted away. I mean, it was literally bending in half. If you lifted the, the floor mats chassis. up in the back, yeah. you could see the road go by. Underneath. Yeah, I, we, I made a turn one day, a hard left turn, and my bass guitar went through the trunk into the road. D goes, hey, man, look in your rearview mirror. There's one of your guitars in the roadway. So, you know, and, and I, the it doors, time. My, the driver's door was welded shut. But we went through a lot of vehicles, a lot of time, a lot of energy just you know, keeping up with the clubs. Uh, and, and again, Andrew couldn't fit everything in the movie, but there was a lot behind the scenes that went on just to make that part of our lives keep going. That grind was amazing. How, were any of you that uh, speaks the night that our truck was set on fire? Anybody hear that? Okay. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about that night, okay? Because, it's a, because it ties in with something you saw in the movie. You, you saw the part in which that club owner... Uh, made that comment, uh, that racially charged comment about what we did with Barry White. That club owner, whose name Jerry Rollins, and the club was called the Rock Palace in Lake Carmel. And it was a really, really messed up night. And he said what he said to me. I mean, I, I went up there to get paid. And he said, you know, anyone who hangs a, a nigger in Lake Carmel is a hero, which was one of the probably, this is where the WWF part of me and the fun part of the band doing it really came crashing down. And it was horrifying. Completely horrifying. Here's the upshot. We stopped playing there. That was it. It was like we, this was our position. We'll never play for that racist again. 
We have nothing to do with it. We changed the show. And we never play for him again. Two years later, our truck was blown. Uh, uh, about a year later, the truck was blown up. About a year after the truck was blown up, one of the ex-wives of his son came up to me uh, while I was playing Pac-Man in Yorktown Heights and said, by the way, uh, you know that truck you had that was, that was blown up at Speaks on Center Fire? I said, yeah. Uh, Jerry had one of his sons do it as retribution for you not playing. So, look, True. I have no proof. There is no proof, but she, you know, where, why would she say it? I absolutely believe it probably happened. So that night that we played Speaks, it was January of 79, I believe, and it was a cold, freezing winter night. We had a brand new 24-foot truck, and I'm doing Sweet Jane third set, and someone yells out, your truck is on fire, which sounds like a joke. And the Speaks stage, and the back door is right here. Open the door, and there was a truck that we just bought first night. 24-foot truck in flames, 50-foot flames. Rat Race Choir's truck was parked next to it because it broke down the night before, and it melted in the heat. And I looked around, and I thought to myself, oh, my God, uh, if this truck explodes, we're all going to die. So I looked at my roadies, and I said, did you guys gas up before you got here? And they said, yeah. So I said, okay, let's get the fuck out. I said, ladies and gentlemen, please turn around and slowly leave this room. Leave now maybe 1,500 people in the room, just leave. I'm watching these flames. I'm praying that this truck does not blow up and blow the wall down and kill everybody. People empty out. Now, this is how it goes in the club scene. I am wearing a little terry cloth top, hot pants, leather boots with six-inch heels, so and my cute. truck is on fire. And I'm a bit traumatized about this. And I walk out to the parking lot, and the police come, the Nassau County police come, the Oceanside police come, the fire department comes, our truck is on fire, they're putting out the fire, I'm standing here in a terry cloth top, it's fucking freezing, little hot pants and my boots, and I can't believe my truck is on fire. And a fan walks up to me and goes, hey, you guys gonna go back on and finish Sweet Jane? Oh, yeah. I was standing and there, I said, what? Happened. I no. fucking paid five dollars. Yeah, I wanna hear the end of this fucking song. I said, my truck is on fire, ass. I'll come back next Thursday. That was how the nights Yeah, that's true. That's speaks. exactly how it went down. Hi. Um, my name is Robert Conti, and I'd just like to share an anecdote with you. I want to thank you guys for how you actually inspired me to get into the music business. I was a, um, I was a kid growing up in Massapequa in like 1982, 83. And I went to St. Rosa Lima. I was in uh, seventh grade. And um, there used to be a record store a couple blocks away called The Record Collection. And I went in there one day, and there were posters celebrating the Stray Cats, and the other half of the store was celebrating Twisted Sister. And I went to the uh, manager. I said, what is this about? What's this band, Twisted Sister? I'd never heard of them before. She goes, oh, um, the brother of the singer manages the, the gym two stores down, and yeah. he, he made us put this up. I said, <laughs> so I, I walked over to the gym, and I think his name was his name Mark? Matt. He, Matt, yeah. Matt, yes. He introduced himself, and um, he, he sold me and my friends on buying you know, five copies of Under the Blade. And, uh, <laughs> Actually, we, we wouldn't let you out without buying yeah. five copies. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, he took it, we took it home, and, and we loved the record. And then um, when You Can't Stop Rock and Roll came out, we went over to Neil's Wax Museum off Sunrise Highway, and uh, we got that opening, you know, I think, the first week it came out. But I wanted to tell you, the, the way you guys promoted yourself inspired me so much that when I got into the music business, I wound up working for bands like Kiss and Metallica and Pantera. And I just want to say, you know, thank you, because that was the very first piece of, you know, uh, pure promotion that, that uh, inspired me. So thanks, guys. Thank you. The, the, uh, the self-promotion that we did, and, and I'm not sitting here trying to be egotistical about it, but what we went through in the clubs to try to get out of that and, and get a record deal um, was not only the guys in the band, but uh, Mark Puma, Joe Gerber, and, you know, Phil Carson. There was a lot of people behind it. But let me tell you, it was, for us, it was fighting a war. We got up on stage every night in those clubs, and, and we did our jobs, and we did it a great job, as everybody, a lot of people here and saw it. But let me tell you, it was, a, it was clawing every inch to try to get signed and become a, a professional band outside of those clubs. I would say the nights were heartwarming and the days were heartbreaking uh, over a very long period of time because the frustrations that you never knew about, the constant rejections. We were turned down more times than a bed sheet in a whorehouse. So the bottom line is, is that the constant negativity, the constant eating at, at you um, developed 
character. But I, you know, I, I say this to people when they say, well, it developed your character. No, it really exposed character because it really shows wh when the chips are down, when your back is against the wall and you have no hope, um, what, you, what happens at that moment, and it happened with so many of our moments, was we kept fighting back and it exposed the, the, the latent character that we had, which was never give up, never give up. And I'll say this too, since every band believes they're important, and, and I get that, and it's, every band busts their ass to greater, lesser, greater degrees. But I will say this about Twisted Sister. If you look at the Beatles Stones, who's Zepp Floyd, Queen, Kiss, Priest, Scorpions, Except for the Beatles, every one of those bands was signed probably within six to 12 months of them starting their band. The Beatles were around three years prior. They busted their ass in Hamburg. And everyone talks about, oh, how they busted their ass in Hamburg. Yeah, I feel for them. Look, I happen to be a huge Beatles fan. None of those bands, not even the Beatles, would have lasted 10 years. And that is what makes the story so interesting. That's what makes this story so great. And by the way, just so you know, when people talk about the classic periods of time that bands support fans, they talk about the Cavern Club, all the people that supported the Beatles, they talk about the San Francisco scene with supporting the Grateful Dead and the airplane. Our fans, our fans saw something that will never be seen again. They saw a club circuit that will never happen again. The drinking age will never be that way again, ever. And you saw a band that put their desperation and soul on the line more than any other band and fought for it. And as Dee pointed out in that opening video, we are proud of you all for staying with us and allowing us to continue to live our dream. I cannot impress that enough to all of you. I, I, uh my name is Jeff, and I was just wondering, can you expand a little bit more on why Tony Petri was kicked out? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Tony. Tony Petri was a great drummer. There's no two ways about it. Um, not the nicest guy in the world. And he had his bouts with drugs and alcohol. And uh, instead of working things out, he would get pretty forceful and violent about it. Well. Um, he and Dee had an, uh, an argument one night, and Tony was wrong, and he reacted in a bad way. Also verbally. And, and, tw and Twisted Sister, uh, despite the fact that I sit here and threaten all of you, we're really not like that, honestly. We never did business that way. We never conducted ourselves that way. And uh, when you push it to the wall and you prove that uh, you're going to resort to violence you know, in, in a business deal, uh, no, nah, it's done. It's out. And that's... That's basically what happened. You know, there was a huge fight at Speaks that Tony was responsible for that put him in the hospital and jeopardized the entire health of our road crew. And that was just part of it. But listen, I'll tell you what. Kind of look at it like this. Any company, but especially a band, a successful band, is like a combination lock. And you keep turning it until you click with all the right people. And you know, it's like that's what happens. Bands click and turn and click and turn and click and turn and until they find the right and guy. And Tony was okay for a while, and then he wasn't okay because it didn't meld with the, re the re with the rest of the guys for a variety of reasons. And then neither did Joey. And when Richie Teeter came in, Richie just did it as a, as a yeah, favor. Yeah, Richie, Richie Teeter never wanted to be a permanent right. member. He just right. kept telling us, I'm doing it temporarily. Right. But so, so like, right. like when AJ was on that screen, I mean, yeah. it's true. He was the fifth one, and, and it all clicked when he joined. Yeah. So that's really the thing to keep in mind, because it's asking me about Tony, you may as well ask me about why did Michael Valentine, the first singer, what happened to him? What happened to Billy? What happened to Mel? I mean, there were a 11, there were 14 lineup changes, and the 11th version of the band made it. Okay, so most of you probably saw two or three versions of it. I lived through all 11. Tony was not any more spectacular in his crash than a bunch of the other guys were. They Very all true. Let, they all let yeah. me down. They all, as far as I'm concerned, they let me down. They were unprofessional. They they couldn't keep it up. So when I hear stuff coming back to me, oh man, so and so should have made it. No, he he wasn't going to make it. He didn't have the goods. He didn't have the goods. It's simple as that. He didn't have the goods. Mark had the goods. AJ had the goods. Eddie had the goods. D. We had the goods. They didn't. That's why it didn't work out. Another question? Yeah, my name's Pete. I'm a big fan from like the 80s. I was a little kid when Twisted Sister came out and just seeing that Stay Hungry record was like, oh wow, that's something. Uh, when you guys went over to England and you saw the response that you got in Europe, why was there never the, say, the option of just relocate to Europe for a short period of time just to keep that fire going rather than going back to the States and waiting out the winter or waiting for stuff to come around. Have you ever moved? 
Really, it's not easy. It's not easy. You, you, I mean, when you want to work in another country, you got to think a lot about just a lot of things other than just going there as a tourist. You know, work papers and just like when people come here, and that's it's not easy to pick up and move and stay someplace for years uh, when your home is here, and that's a real problem. It really, and, and you and couldn't it, do it. We couldn't afford to do it, and it was never an option because we yeah. couldn't get the work papers which are necessary, and they right. do check at shows over there. Oh yeah, so let's yeah. talk about the reality of it, right? The JJ French part that says, "Oh, I have to be a manager. I can't be a rock star." So who the hell spent the time down the immigration office trying to get extension papers while the rest of the band's rehearsing for Under the Blade? Me. I mean, it's a drag. Yeah. You go down there for hour after hour after hour, and you pray to, that they'll extend your stay another three or four days or a week or two months or whatever. So we get to England. And by the way, you know, it was nice that Martin Hooker, who is a great guy, brought us over there. But you know what? That album budget was $18,000 or something like that. It wasn't, you know, it Michael was Jackson, uh, 750000 Def Leppard, $2 million. It, Secret records. It was such a secret. They kept it a secret from everybody, including us and the bankers. They cost 18000 And I'll tell you what, make it even worse. So eighteen grand, which which covered... Us going there yeah. and living in various locations while we were there and then having to come back and get money and then going back over again and they go bankrupt. When we signed to Atlantic, how's this one? So we sign and we make our record. What was our budget? It was $60,000 to make Can't Stop Rock and Roll. 60000 And when you hear the band goes over budget, they go over budget by like 50000 100000 a million, $2 million. We went over budget by 4000 Five hundred dollars, four thousand. So it came to sixty-four thousand five hundred. You know what the record label said to us? We're not releasing your album in America unless you pay us back four thousand five hundred fucking dollars. That's what Atlantic told us when we got back. That's after we had hit singles, after we had a hit tour, after the record went top twenty. We came back here and we're told we owe them. 4500 bucks. So when you ask that question, there's your reality. It ain't easy, man. It really is not easy. And what did we do? With no tour support, because we were able to successfully save some money, we got in that Winnebago, and we drove 56 hours to Salt Lake City, and it broke down. That's and Mark is movie. freaking underneath the goddamn thing like he's at a, like a, you know, like at a muffler shop. He would introduce me, and my and I'd put my foot up my boot, and, and people would shake my boot. Because he was under yeah. the Winnebago. Because I was always under, he's the, under the Winnebago. <laughs> Winnebago so he again. fixes that, and then we drive. Uh, then we get out of there, and we drive to to no. We went to, we went from. We went from uh, Salt Lake City to Denver, and then on the way from Denver to, to, uh, to, to Arizona, the Winnebago breaks down in Rotan, in Rotan New, New Mexico, Mexico on, on a Sunday, Sunday morning, morning at 6 a.m., one of the most religious no, it doesn't towns. doesn't break down. Well, it ran. It no, died. No, there was a fire in yeah, the engine. The engine, the engine compartment in a Winnebago it. is inside the passenger compartment. All right. There was a fire in the Winnebago. You know what's in Rotan, New Mexico back then? It's at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Tumbleweed. So we, the car, the Winnebago basically winds down the highway and breaks down in front of a diner. Now I get out of the diner and I, I and I said to the guys in the band, "Don't look out the window and keep D as far away from the window as you possibly exactly. can." And I walked in and I said, "Hey man, we're the Southern Cross <laughs> band from, from down south, and a Winnebago broke down, and you think you can all help us because we got a gig." You know, in, in that Tempe, Arizona. And they said, well, I'll tell you what. You go to the Annie Get Your Gun bar across the street. It's and true. you talk to Pistol Man Gino. His partner, Dwayne, owns an ugly duckling used car agency. And he'll rent you some cars so you all can finish out your tour. The names so are true. I went across the street to the Annie Get Your Gun bar. And there was a guy cleaning up at 5 in the morning. And I said, hey, man. I said, hey, y'all know where I can find Pistol Man Gino. And he gives me the dude's phone number. I go to the pay phone, I call up this number, I wake him up, he gives me his partner Wayne's number, I call Wayne, he says, I run the Ugly Duckling used car agency, but what are y'all going to do with that Winnebago since it's broken down? You should take it to the Chevy dealership where Happy Gonzalez can fix it for you. Absolutely true. So they, we leave the Winnebago because it's broken down. We get these two rented cars. I couldn't fix it. It was a blown transmission. Yeah, blown. The whole Winnebago was totally screwed. By the way, we're responsible for getting that Winnebago. Yeah, we were responsible. Back to Jersey. Get, back to New Jersey, your connection. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and we get these two rented cars, which are only good to Tempe. Mm -hmm. 
because it's a local used car agency. It's a really local used car agency. I don't know how much we spent, probably all of our mm -hmm. usable cash. Get to Tempe, leave them, get two rent -a cars, and then we finish the entire United States tour with no Winnebago, the five guys in the band, three road crew, one truck, two drivers, and we went from Tempe oh, Volvo to Riverside, Riverside to Sacramento, Sacramento to LA, LA back to Denver, and then 22 hours straight from Denver, Houston, Beaumont, Austin, 36 hours straight back to New York, played the beacon, the beacon. dropped everything, got on a plane, flew to England, and did a, another uh, European tour. That was the story of Can't Stop Rock and Roll. So again, it's not even there yet, right? It's not there, but that's, the shit just didn't stop. This shit did not stop. You left stop, out man. losing each other with the flat tire on the way back to New York from uh, oh, from Beaumont. Remember? From Beaumont. Yeah, I remember Night on 81. Yes. And we were told, by the way, don't speed through West Virginia. They'll yeah. never see you again. Right. No, <laughs> don't speed in West Virginia. I mean, I'll tell you, Mark was, I, you were fixing everything. You know, here we were trying to be rock stars, and you were broke. I mean, completely broke, on our ass. We're, we're, we're basically surviving on fumes. And we wound up, here's the good news. We sold 100,000 albums wow. just by that. So when we got back from Europe and the record label basically said, by the way, we didn't spend a penny on you. And you sold 100,000 albums. So it means if we send something, it's going to be a hit. But that's, that's, how tough, that's how tough it was. It was never a moment where things weren't it was easy. like, where things were easy. It never was, man. Everybody was exhausted. The driving, because I didn't driving. do much. You did yeah, most of the driving. You and D. D. D, and um, Joe. And That's Joe right. and Charlie yeah. Barreca. And Charlie yeah, Barreca. Yeah, you guys yeah, right. did most of the driving. We did fucking the rent cars in rent a cars. And we were out when we were out on, the, on that, the third act on that, you know, Five Foot Crocus tour. Uh, that was routed. That was the last tour that's routed every summer. And the way major agencies work is they try and write it, route it logically, but only the big acts get their preferences of dates. So a tour like that crisscrosses back, forth, sideways. And if you don't have a tour bus, you, you know, you're working four or 500 miles a night, every night. Every, yes, and every we were point. driving ourselves. It was impossible. Yeah, and if you look in the map, it actually <laughs> shows it. Um, when they talk about the tour, as little as they do in the movie, it really does just go yeah, like no, this. It was, it was routed. I mean, by, to the point dark. where the point where you almost just laugh. <laughs> you know, you go, okay, really? All right, it's as fucked up as you could get. Let's just make it more fucked up. But, but the beauty of the band, and let's talk about being straight. Do you yeah. think we could have accomplished any of this if we were fucked up? Do you think seriously, if any of us had like drug and alcohol problem, we could have accomplished any of it? We were like the straightest band on the planet and we had to portray ourselves as the sickest band on the planet because that was what we portrayed ourselves as. But meanwhile, we were just a bunch of hard working guys, like a really hard working guys in a business that was supposed to, you know, rely on partying every night and all that shit. Who the hell had time to that? Yeah, no time. No the question. I my name is Jim Chinisi, and I think I speak for everybody when I say thank you and congratulations on 40 years of rocking our asses off. Why don't you guys give these guys a hand? Thank you very much. And my question is, in the embryonic stages of the band when, like, D first joined, will that material ever see the light of day? Well, a lot of it's out. I mean, it's really on club days. And there's CDs out there. It's, out, it's all out. I don't think, Mark, this... Anything that's not out. I think just about every song has even been bootlegged from live stuff. Um, I don't think we have great recordings of every single well, thing. Well, wait a minute, though. We went back and the Comeback's a great recording. Comeback, yeah, you know, I cried because we did it on the Still Hungry album, yeah, right? So I, we did. Yeah, I don't think every single thing has a great, a great studio recording. Probably though. not. Yeah. Because Mark's our so. producer now. But there's every, just about everything is, um, yeah. is out there. The question really is, would we play it? And Dee's got this aversion, man. I mean, he writes this stuff, and it's his songs. And he just says, I don't relate to it anymore. I can't sing it. I don't feel it. You know, it's his music. It's hard to argue. I was reading an interview with, uh, with the guys in Black Sabbath. They were talking about the fact that Ozzy doesn't want to do certain songs. He doesn't feel it. He writes the songs. It's not our choice, really. He doesn't feel it. He won't sing it. Not much we can do about it. Hey guys, uh, once again, thanks for a really great movie. Uh, it's educational and it really taught me a lot uh, as to what you guys had gone through over the years. Uh, and knowing I was coming here, revisiting some of your videos, I uh, of course pulled up You Can't Stop Rock and Roll. And it is probably one of my favorite videos from you guys. Uh, funny. Any, any good stories off the set of, of making that video or any fond memories yeah. of uh, that time back then? Yeah, the van that we were in, if you oh. want to call it a oh. van. Um, we could have died. It, it, yeah, we could have died. It it uh, it was an old ratty British <laughs> van, and uh, 
in that parking lot we pulled into, there was a very big bump. And when we hit the bump, the gas tank fell out, started a fire, and is lucky we left it behind the road, and we just cruised to a stop. And for the rest of the shooting of the video, we had a five-gallon uh, plastic uh, can of gasoline that we put the fuel pump uh, feed into, you, and that's... You, thought you that's, told me if a yeah. spark had hit the wrong way, yeah, the whole thing would have blown up, right? Know. But you yeah, told it, me that it, after, yeah. at the end of yeah, the day. I, I didn't tell anybody how dangerous it was. So, yeah, we had gas fumes in the vehicle, so there was no top on it. But the, we had one day to do the video. That was it. We had to get it done. So. And that included the concert stuff inside, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, like everything else, the motor vehicle breaks, I fix it. Yeah. I have a question. Since D's off being D, what are the chances of the four of the guys getting together and doing the really early stuff in the show? Like a one-off, all of the early JJ stuff. <laughs> What's the chance that you sing it? <laughs> I'd be there much ain't worse enough than JJ. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to radio. Ladies and gentlemen, Twisted Fucking Sister. Can Our I, director. Uh, way, the, can, can I just say, whoa, can I just say this, please? First of all, first of all, uh, we want to say um, that we have been dedicating a lot of our nights and our days to the memory of A.J. Puro, who was just a, a heart and soul of this band. Okay, that's number one. Number two, next year, 2016, is the official 40th anniversary because it's, it marks 40 years of me, D, and, and Eddie. Eddie joined 40 years ago on this past October 1st, and D joined on the, on the 26th of, uh, of um, February in 97. It was 40 years. So we attained a 40-year life. And then and Mark came on, and it feels like 50 years, right, Mark? It feels like a billion fucking <laughs> it's years. It's more like 75. And uh, it's just, you know what? I mean, I mean that's really the amazing part, that um, bands weren't supposed to last like this. They weren't. And yet, there's a handful of us out there, and, uh, and all the bands that have survived 40 years have done it because they've worked really hard. So whether it's KISS or, or, or ACDC or, 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 or um, Scorpions, for example, uh, Priest, um, Motorhead, there's a bunch of us out there that have done it. And, it has been a, and every one of those bands has a, has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a long, hard road, and none of us were supposed to have been able to survive it. So I just give kudos to all those. I, I would like to that. acknowledge before I'll let you go after, but I, this you guys wouldn't have if you didn't do what you did, we wouldn't have had the child we had, and this movie wouldn't have been possible. But if it wasn't for our director Andrew Horn, who spearheaded this and said this is important enough to make a movie about, he deserves a round of applause. Yeah, that's by the way. If you didn't, if you didn't, what do they say? If a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to listen, would it make a sound? Uh, Andrew did, did a favor to us as a band and to you as fans and to the world in general for all the lessons learned from it by uh, having the balls, the guts, and the stick to itiveness to, to stick on this thing for like eight years because uh, it's really been a fucking labor of love and a hell of a lot of work, and you, we owe you a lot. I want to add one more thing to that yeah. because I think it sometimes gets a little lost in, the, in, in an age where people hire actors to do essentially vanity pieces to themselves. Andrew approached the band. He had heard a little bit about the story. He asked if they minded him trying to do this story. And, Again, let me just and oh, it must be me. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the band said, okay, let's see. And <laughs> <laughs> this is not a twisted piece. This is something Andrew made. This is his view of it based on all the information and the, and the interviews. It just looks like we cooperated because we liked it so much that we, you know, we're up here. But this is his vision and incredible amount of work that he put in, and money, and you know, living on ramen, and just, just, we. It started to sort of parallel the twisted story, I think, at some point. I'll say this too: when Andrew started, it really started as a conversation that we had had, and he, and he, and the, the question he said to me: if I'm going to do this, you have to let me tell my version of Twisted Sister. It's not your, and, and he's right. When you bring a documentary filmmaker in. Um, they're not going to tell my story or Dee's story or Mark's story or AJ. They're gonna, he's going to tell the story that he sees. So I can look at it and go, oh, I have this opinion, or these guys can look at the opinion. But the fact is, when, it, when a, if, if, if a documentary filmmaker is really going to make the right documentary, he sees it the way he sees it. And so for that, I still, I still applaud you because you did a fucking great job. Great job. Amazing. You have a question?
Uh, yeah, because when you and I had this question, uh, this discussion, uh, JJ was in an earlier film of mine called The Nomi Song, which was about Klaus Nomi, who was a new wave um, performer. And uh, he was as much of a singer as, as he was, or a rock singer as he was. He was also a performance artist. And he was an opera singer, and he actually used to sing opera in clubs, and people would actually like it. And he dressed in this costume that made him look like sort of a, uh, an Art Deco spaceman, and he wore this makeup. And he was hugely popular in, uh, in Manhattan and the Lower East Side, and they wanted to test the waters and see how he would do outside of this enclave. So somebody got the idea that Twisted Sister, uh, they wear makeup and crazy costumes, and he wears makeup and crazy costumes, so why doesn't he open for Twisted Sister and see if he can get that audience? And this show lasted, what, four minutes? Yeah, Before he had well, to be taken off the stage for his own protection. What happened was he looked like a gay, he looked like a gay Ace Freely with receding hair. That's what he looked like. He had a space outfit. Didn't go and when Joe while. said, the guy's here, I went to the dressing room. You know, now I'm dressed in, in JJ French clothes, but I'm talking like John, not like, you know. So I walk into the room, I go, hey man, you know, like good to see you. And he's like uh, in this German kind of performance artist kind of pose. And I'm thinking, well, you know, these are just two guys talking behind the scenes. This is not some sort of performance art. Like, hi, Jim, let's have a be like that. And he's very much into this speaking in this weird voice. And I said to myself, shit, if this dude really goes out there with this shtick, he's going to fucking get eaten alive. They're going to kill him. And he did. He and he was. And it so annihilated him that he was traumatized forever from that. Not forever, well, but he was traumatized well, I mean, for a while. He was just fucking freaked. That's why Andrew interviewed me. He said, what yeah. happened that night? I said, the night of the bloodbath of Klaus Nomi? Soap Factory? They didn't get it. I said to you, Soap Factory may be four miles from CBGB's, but it's a thousand miles from Manhattan and, and mentality-wise. And that's how, well, that's how we met. You said something in the movie that, that sort of but going in me, which is you said to sort of explain the, the, the disconnect that it was uh, New York City performance art done in a blue collar suburban bar. Yeah, and they and we knew the people we were playing to, and they got us, and so we didn't have the we didn't have to have a problem with it. Whereas every time the Dolls tried it, to be honest, they bombed. <laughs> Could you imagine the Dolls in 1973? True story. Twisted Sister, the original version of the band, was the house band at the Hatter. You know, we had a lead singer, Michael Valentine. His real name was Michael O'Neill, and he's drinking with everybody else. And they brought out the New York Dolls, a competing club, because they had a glitter band at the Mad Hatter. Except this glitter band at the Mad Hatter was a bunch of blue-collar guys who drank with everybody in the bar, drank with all the bartenders. Everybody had a party. So what if me and the singer were chained together and kissed and wore female clothes? Everyone thought it was a party. Dolls came out with no humor, played this tiny little stage in the corner of the room with a hot dog beach, and it was probably the worst reaction I've ever seen in a band because no one knew how to deal. And uh, I have to say, what the bar scene did for us made us great entertainers. At the end of the day, we learned all of the tricks of the trade, and we learned the responsibility, not just to be great entertainers, we learned the responsibility of showing up on time, doing our show correctly, making sure that we answered the bell every time and delivering. That was all done with the discipline through the hard work forged through the fires of the bar scene. Well, okay, so to finish my story, um, so said in the movie, and then I went over to his house to, uh, to check the scene because uh, I wanted to make sure that we were actually using twisted music and not some cover music so we didn't have to deal with the rights. And we just got to talking and uh, you started telling me uh, a lot of the stories that were in this movie of the Barry White and the destruction of the clubs uh, and the Sweet Jane uh, Drink Till You Puke gong show. And, you know, he says, this was New York City performance art in a blue collar suburban bar. And I'm hearing these stories thinking, this is the performance art that goes with the, the blue collar suburban bar. And that was the thing that sort of hooked in my head. And I was really wanted to make a movie about that, about those kinds of acts that you did. And that's the way it started. And I figured this was maybe an hour, you know? And it would be really fun. And when did you realize you were in trouble, Andrew? Yeah, right. <sighs> I realized in trouble, I was in trouble when I realized that I had interviewed 50 people. Yeah, I think when the first cut came in at seven hours, I think that's probably when you realized there was and, uh, and And I realized that I had this epic story um, that I had to deal with. And, you know, you sit, just sitting here and listening to the, the sort of the background stories that everybody's telling, 
not all of them, but a lot of them were told in the course of all these interviews. And part of the reason why the movie took so long is it was really hard to decide what not to use. And as Joe says, yeah, it was like four hours long. I, the first public show I did was almost three hours long. And, um, and as a result, this is now a little over two hours and there's going to be 63 extras, uh, extra stories on the DVD. By the way, is Donna here? Is Donna yeah, here? Donna's Donna here. She's back up. there. Donna, Where's Donna? Donna, 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 come here. Come here. Come here. Come on, Donna. 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 Don't be come shy. On here. Donna. Get off. Donna. Donna. The Donna. mayor. Come on. Donna. Oh, Donna. Donna. Oh, Donna. Donna. Are you coming down? What are you doing? Let's go. Come Get on. down here. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. the star of the movie. Yeah, Donna. The last the word. She has the last word in the movie. Donna Bocuse. <laughs> the star. Donna wrote a song it's under the blade, under the stage, because she was like standing in front of the Man, stage. For let me say something about the about the front row girls. That didn't that. It's in the extras. It's in the extras. Oh, yeah. There were there were there were a group of people. There were a few guys, but it was mostly women. We were the most diligent band on the club circuit. Clubs would open at nine o'clock. Most bands would show up at eleven to play their three sets. We would show up at seven so we could do a two-hour sound check before the club opened, and then you're sitting around till eleven or midnight. You know, two hours to put on makeup, but the rat's killing a lot of time. We would get there at 7 o'clock at night. Club doesn't open until 9 in the winter on a Wednesday, two hours outside of New York in the opposite direction from where most of these people live. And there'd be a line of 20, 30 people, and always Donna at the head every night. First the, one in line. Donna! Waiting, just standing there, waiting. And as soon as the doors would open, they'd go right to their spots on the stage, you know, and they would line up. The, the, and they all had, it was like a sign seating. And, uh, as a matter of fact, I think, is it in the DVD extras, the story about the... We were having some acoustic problems with some bleed. Mark's bass when he joined yeah, the band. Yeah, that's, that's in there. Was bleeding too much into, into, the, into uh, Dee's mic. Uh, no, rather into the guitar mic. So we, for acoustic reasons, Eddie and, and Mark were switched. Which we, and it was a great acoustic solution. Everything worked. But we didn't realize the havoc we were wreaking with the front row. So the lights come up. The first time we did, the lights come up, and you look at the front row, and they're like, <laughs> just and, they, and panic. And yeah. but and it, we're talking a pack room. We're talking sardines. By the time the first song ended, they had come through in like this mesh, and it's like a big sea of fish swimming through. The guys each other. in the band watching this stuff, <laughs> and by the more end, of, fun watching them. Absolutely. Than us playing the song. And by the that, end of what you don't know, they're all perfectly lined perfectly up lined on the other in reverse. Perfectly lined up. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> and also, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the two radio stations that gave us a lot of support were LIR first and BAB second. These stations supported the local band, supported the local band, WBAB. Su supported us. <laughs> BAB supported us, did a lot of shows. I mean, they're famous. In fact, the BAB live concerts being released. Um, uh, in the first quarter of oh, this year, the LIR show is being released and the BAB show is being released in conjunction with the live at Donington concert in England. It's going to be a three CD live set. So for all of you who either taped it off of the uh, radio back in the day or and, and have like a worn out uh, version of it and don't have it, BAB and LIR definitely. And you guys really deserve a great deal of uh, thank you for that. Well, thank you. And I just we have a new feature on BAB at five o'clock in the afternoon during my show called Live at Five. And we just did Twisted Sister uh, last night, and we played two tracks from when you did the American uh, Music Hour, that, that uh, pre-canned concert show. I think it was a concert recorded King over Biscuit in or England. Those? No, it wasn't a King Biscuit. It was the American Media something or other. But there's an eight-minute version of I Want to Rock. <laughs> there's not that many lyrics. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I would like to, I would like to, Mark, if you have one, I just want to say that this is the single funniest Twisted Sister story that I know. I have on the bar, and you may have one, and if you do, you should tell it. I want to tell mine. Okay, one night at the fore and aft in White Plains, which we did nine months straight on Tuesday nights in 1977 and 1978. We're kind of getting bored. No. We're kind of getting bored, and, this, and the stage was very high up. 
So the amplifiers were very high up, and it was really loud. And the amps were like here. And some guy kept going, it's not fucking loud enough. It's not loud enough. It's not loud enough. I said, really, asshole? It's not loud enough. Come on. So he comes on stage, and we're playing. He goes, it's loud enough. It's not loud enough. I said, really? Stand over to the amplifier. So the guy walks over to the Marshall stacks behind us. And I said, go ahead. Put your head over there. He put it loud enough, not loud enough. I said, put your arms out like Jesus. And we duct taped the guy to the Marshall amplifiers. Okay, now, oh, yeah. now, here's what happened. He's oh, yeah. like this. For the entire one hour set, he is duct taped. And I'm kind of concerned during the course of the set, but he's like, <coughs> so I would turn around, how you doing? And he's like, <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, this fucking guy is out of his, like, but this must be like a great thing. Okay, I'll always remember the expression of this dude taped to this amplifier all night. So now, a couple of years ago, I'm walking through Grand Central Station. And a guy comes up to me, hey, JJ, you JJ, right? You don't look like that, do you? You are JJ, right? Hey, remember four and a half? Uh, yeah. South, man, yeah. You remember that guy that you taped an amplifier? I went, was that you? He goes, no, that was my best friend, but he still says that was the best day of his fucking life. <laughs> I'm glad we made it. True this story. Go, True Martin. story. Yeah, that's on the doubt. DVD as well. Go. You got one. Go. Go. Oh, there's, Go. there's too many. Um, one of the one of the stories that really stands out, and um, I was thinking of one, but I'm not gonna because it's gonna embarrass someone. But uh, that's on the DVD too. Oh, it's really? <laughs> yes. Oh man, it's not gonna embarrass me. That's for sure. You remember when we stayed at the Riverhead Motel? Uh, which time? The, well, we we played a. a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday was 4th of July weekend, yeah. 1979, yeah. okay? And we stayed at the Riverhead yes, Motel, I do actually which, which yes. back then, uh, it, you said the hotel rooms are 39 We, You got it. I, mean, I think Joe got it at like $9, $9 a night. $9. You, can't, you can't imagine how bad. The, it, it was unbelievable. That, that, that night or that weekend, yeah, that, the, the, as soon as we woke up the next day, the crew was still up from the night before. Remember, we didn't have to break down our equipment because we were playing the same right. club. But I remember walking outside and seeing Elmo jump into the pool. Now, that pool, right, now that pool hadn't been used literally in 30 years. So it was half full, had trees growing out of it, it was and it was green, green water. Slimy. Jelly green at the bottom. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. It was a super fun site or something. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and as I walk out of my room and, and a couple other people coming out, we're ready to go get some, some lunch at this time. It was breakfast for us. And one goes, hey, watch everybody, and does a swan dive into this pool. Okay? And he disappears. <laughs> well, I mean, who knows if he hit his head on the bottom or something. That would explain a lot. He's, under, he's in this green goo holding his breath. <laughs> And finally, he pops up, you know, waving his arms like he's dying or something. And he comes out. He's green. I mean, the guy's green. His hair is green. It's, it's is green. Yeah. It just and the stuff like that was was nonstop with our rope. You got an Elmo story, too? Cause I, got I got one, too, actually. Yeah. I, I was at the fact. Was it the soap factory or the factory that had the bar right in front of the store? That was, that was, that was the, the factory in Staten Island. the factory in Staten Island. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Snoopy is the factory. We got there really early. And Elmo's hanging the lights. Right. And he falls off the ladder. And he drops, got to be five feet, and lands on his back. Now, I saw it from standing a few feet away. He lands on his back. He's like this. And he rolls up, and he's got a Leco light in his, in his <laughs> gut. And he's holding He goes. And he's like flipping over, and he plugs it, and he goes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he saved the light. That's all that mattered. <laughs> we played, one night we are playing New Hammerheads, 2,000 people. Out of the 2,000, what, 1,950 are guys, right? So the men's room is taking a beating. Now the, the crew's breaking down. Nobody can find Elmo. It's 4.30 in the morning. Where's Elmo? Where's Elmo? Five, he emerges from the men's room. He's got the two little, two urinal discs, you know, the cakes that are in the bottom. He's got one on each eye. One on each eye, right. and, and he's, he's singing, singing, the, singing the theme from Andy. The sun will come out to tomorrow. Oh, like this. The urinals on his eyes. You know, Elmo yeah. used to oh, do yeah. these things called sponge shots. He, yeah. would, take, he yeah. would take a sponge at the end of the night with all the crap on the bar. He would do bar that, eggs. squeeze it into, into a, a, glass. a shot glass, Ring it into and a glass. drink it. Yeah, drink these the were the thing. people that entertained us. On a nightly basis. And he would go down with every bartender and do a bar reg with each bartender all the way. Now, some of these bars had like 15 bartenders. And by, 
And by the way, he rolled our truck. Yes, several six times. times. Six that, times. That we know of. That we know of. Six times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was very. So you wonder what we put up with in the bar. On the other the hand. Yeah. All right, we got to go. Okay, we wait, okay, before we go, I just have to do one thing. Okay, wait a minute. The bill. Because, yes, because, because, this, this, is, because this is the first American show and because it's Long Island and because this is Twisted Sister, I have here a copy of Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> it's a double record set, so there's one for each of you. And I'm so successful, I hire people to smash my disco records now. You know? <laughs> if, if it's a new, one of the newer records may not break. Oh, now wouldn't you just want to... <laughs> you going to take it home and play it? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, Should we use it as a Frisbee in the parking lot, Mark? Yeah, it really is. Saturday okay, you got to smash what it. What has happened to you? Oh, my God. What, where is the JJ that you I know? Smash it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> you want? Hey, listen, everybody. Was the movie entertaining? Did you get Andrew it a Horn? Five? Andrew Horn, right. ladies and gentlemen, his vision.